Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Sally McKenzie. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you what I consider to be some of the exquisite beauty of biology. I am a biologist by training, and I uh, look forward here. And so before I tell you a little bit about the beautiful story I have to tell you, I first want to start with a couple of concepts I'd like you to think about. One is, of course, the year 2050. It is the magic year that life scientists and plant scientists are thinking about and to some extent dreading. And I want you to think a little bit about evolution. And no, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for how many of you believe in the concept. I'm going to take for granted that I will convince you that there's something very, very beautiful about understanding evolution and what it means for us. So let me tell you first a little bit about 2050. 2050 is the year that we, as biologists, our, our understanding as a community will be the time when we're looking at 9 billion people and the need for us to double our food, uh, our food production capabilities. To double them is, is not trivial, but what's more important is that we're going to attempt to double them on less arable land than we currently have, under circumstances where the climate is changing at a rate that we don't altogether understand or have the ability to anticipate. And we're going to try to do all of this with, for some, to some extent, the technologies we have now. Because for a biologist, 2050 is right around the corner. And with the rate at which we develop new technologies, biology really, I mean, 2050 sounds very much like it's tomorrow. So with that in mind, we have to think rather creatively about the way that Mother Nature deals with this kind of a, a growing problem of needing change faster than change actually normally occurs. So when we think about change, we have to think a little bit about evolution because that is the ultimate process of change that drives everything that we do on this earth. So it isn't only about change when we think about the fact that we have to change the way we do things on Earth. We have to think a little bit about the way we're going to change our lifestyle, our eating habits, our reproductive processes as, as a population if we're going to survive as a species. But it's also about the process of change on Earth, okay? The process of evolution and how it's regulated. Because quite frankly, everything's going to have to be sped up a bit in order for us to make this 2050 deadline. So when we think about the way things change, as biologists, the first thing we do is to go to a simpler system than we ourselves present. We are multicellular organisms. There's relatively a uh, limited way that we can change more rapidly than we already do. So we can go to a simple model system like bacteria. And what we can learn from bacteria is what they do as a population when their population is threatened by a changing environment that changes faster than they can actually accommodate. You know about bacteria like this because you've experienced them or at least feared them when you've gone into any hospital. You know that we refer to them as superbugs. These are bacteria that basically now tolerate any antibiotic that we throw at them. So how did we come up with those superbugs? Well, in fact, what we did was we plopped them down into a very hostile environment. Because bacteria actually, as single-celled organisms, can reproduce rather quickly. But in fact, they can sense their environment. And what we did, by creating as many antibiotics as we have, and by using them as often as we have to treat our diseases, and even our suspected occurrences of disease, is that we've created such a hostile environment that any bacterium that was going to survive had to, in essence, speed up its evolution. So how does this work? Bacteria, well, all organisms, in order to go from one cell to two, must replicate their genetic information. 
DNA basically is a double helix. It has to open up and it has to be copied. And in the process of copying, there are proteins that come in and take care of that process and don't always do it with perfect fidelity. There's an imperfection to the process. What that means is that as it's copying, sometimes it miscopies and adds the wrong base or nucleotide. And in the process of that, creates what we call a mutation. If it's allowed to reside there, that gene won't express the way it should. Or maybe it won't make the right kind of protein. Or maybe it'll make a new kind of protein. But that's the nature of mutation. So what, what bacteria have to make sure the system works properly is a gene that's called MUTE-S. MUTE is short for mutator. MUTE-S is a gene, and its protein is responsible for basically providing surveillance, running up and down that DNA strand, and asking, did we get everything right? And it's, it's basically a surveillance mechanism looking for any mismatch, anything that isn't fitting quite right. And what MUTES does when it scans up and finds that place that didn't happen, didn't replicate properly, is it sits there, it calls in and recruits a couple of its buddy proteins, and they basically fix it up. Take out what was wrong, put in what's right, clean up the system. So this is basically what we do. It's basically what bacteria do to make sure the mutation rate stays very low. So here's the crux of it. MUTES as a protein regulates the rate of mutation. Now it sounds like a good system. Basically, you clean up all your mistakes, you keep everything just the way you want it. But what Mother Nature figured out very early on is, what if I were to actually make a mistake in MUTES? What if I were to make it so that MUTES didn't work exactly right? What would actually happen to a bacterial population? So let me tell you. What you're looking at in this slide in the top panel is basically a lawn of bacteria where we've placed a drop of antibiotic in the center, in the white spot. And what I want you to notice, I hope you can see it back there, is that there's a halo where bacteria don't grow. And at the periphery of that halo, you see bacterial cultures growing just fine. Why? Because they're far enough away that the concentration of antibiotic is low enough that they can tolerate it. What's more important is look in the bottom panel. And in the bottom panel is where that bacterium has undergone a mutation in MUTES. So MUTES is not functioning properly. And as a consequence, what I want you to notice basically in that halo is that there are plenty of colonizing bacteria. Guys that came in got a little closer and found they could tolerate them. Why is that? Well, it turns out that when you don't have a mute S protein functioning properly, obviously the mutation rate goes up. Basically, as those bacteria are replicating their genetic information, they're making more mistakes. Well, most of those mistakes probably aren't very useful, but the probability goes up if you're going to shoot, you know, if, if you're going to basically uh, bet on this system, that you're going to come up with every so often a mutation that makes it more able to survive, to adapt. And basically, these have undergone mutations that allow them now to tolerate antibiotic. Okay, those are the superbugs that we see in hospitals. When we go in and we look at these bacteria that are now hyper able to handle the antibiotics we're throwing at them, it turns out that many of them, if not all of them, have mutations in mutants. There's a theme here. Mother Nature's figured out a key to survival. When your environment becomes extra hostile, what do you do? You increase your mutation rate. You increase the rate at which evolution occurs. You change it up a little bit and hope, if this is all sort of a crapshoot, that a few of them are going to get by and get through by virtue of coming up with the right kind of mutation. This is a key to when the way Mother Nature has handled that adverse environment that we created for bacteria. So what can we learn from this? So what are we thinking about by 2050? This, this need to be able to feed all people on Earth? Well, it turns out that our Earth is becoming a little more hostile for us. What we know now is that we're seeing a lot more drought. This is a picture of the Midwest this summer. What we also know is that environments are extremely variable and extremely different in the amount of water they're going to deal with. We also know, this is from my home state of California, that we're going to deal with some serious salinity problems, and we're already seeing them in a lot of our soils. We also know that in places like Africa, the challenges are that much more difficult. So, this is the environment in which we are going to double our yields in order to feed 
a growing environment by 2050. So what is our solution going to be? Well, my lab has been studying this for a few years, trying to understand a little bit about what plants know and understand about their environment as the environment becomes hostile. What I want to tell you is that my lab recently cloned a gene. And this is a very interesting gene. Because when this gene in plants is not functioning properly, very unusual things happen to the plant. This is just a little weed that you'd have in your, in your yard. It's called a rabidopsis. But actually for us, this is our lab rat. This is what we do all of our genetic experiments on. It's a beautiful model system for plants. What I want to tell you is, this is before that mutation, and this is after that mutation. And what this plant is now doing is going perennial. It's now making many more leaves. It's flowering and then flowering again. It's gone perennial. So it doesn't have its normal life cycle as it used to. Well, if we were to actually introduce that mutation to, excuse me, to sorghum, which is an important crop that uh, might actually wind up feeding Africa in the next several years, this is what happens. This is a normal sorghum plant. This is what happens when we mutate only one gene. Again, very strange changes in leaf morphology, changes in leaf branching, changes in flowering. These plants really change the way they develop. Same thing in tobacco. This is a normal tobacco plant. Here's one of these funny ones where we actually just introduced that one mutation. We're just down-regulating one gene, and of course we've transformed the way it, it grows. Now, if you were to be able to ask one of these plants, what actually happened to you? Why did you totally transform the way you're growing, and why are you growing this way? What it would tell you, and the way it tells you this, is by its gene expression pattern, which we can assay in a global way, look at all the genes that have changed in their expression. That plant would tell you, I think I have seen stress, incredible stress, not only drought stress, but salt stress, and heat stress, and maybe cold stress, and any other kind of stress I can think of that's an abiotic stress or a, an environmental stress. All at one time, all of those pathways for stress response are all upregulated from the time that plant grows from a seed all the way till it flowers. Now that's not normal. Those genes aren't normally supposed to be on all the time. They're only supposed to come on when the plant sees stress. So when you turn them on all the time, it obviously affects their development. But that's not the only point here. There are two other things I want to tell you about. One is that this gene that we cloned is a gene that's responsive to the environment. All plants have it. We ourselves don't have it. All green living plants have this gene. And whenever a plant sees stress, it downregulates this gene right away. What I've done here is to downregulate that gene artificially in the lab. So that says that Mother Nature knows how to do what I did in the lab. That condition I'm showing you, that's a condition that can be created by Mother Nature also. When a plant sees stress like drought and salt or heat or cold, that gene goes down. That means I've, I've actually seen a little bit of what Mother Nature has the capacity to do. So why am I telling you about this? Because if I take one of those plants that's been altered in this way, so that it thinks that it's seen all kinds of stress, and I cross it back to the plant I started with before I stressed it out. If I do that, and I grow up what comes from that, this is what I see. Now there's a whole lot of diversity in this field. What I want to point out to you is this is the plant I started with. That's this guy here. And I want you to look at how many are taller or shorter, earlier flowering or later flowering, higher yielding, lower yielding, all kinds of diversity, and I didn't make one genetic change in this field, okay? That kind of diversity is the kind of diversity we wish that we could preserve for our breeding efforts in order to double that yield. Because you know what? Some of these plants in this field have already doubled their yield, and I'm only one generation away. What on earth did I do? I told that plant it was stressed out, I crossed it back to its original self, and this thing went wild and gave me all kinds of diversity we've never seen from one plant before. I can't tell you all the ins and outs of what I've done so far. That's what my lab is going to study for the next five years. But I can tell you that this seems to be rather magical insofar as sorghum isn't the only one that does this. So we dramatically change the yield of sorghum 
by this one gene and tampering with this one gene. But the same thing happens in tomato. Here you're seeing flowering and fruit formation here compared to the one that we started with. And here you're seeing it in soybean. This is a crop we grow in the state. I don't know if you can see back there, but I've doubled the number of pods on that one plant. Just tampered with this one gene. Isn't that wild? And basically all I did was tell that plant, you've seen all kinds of stress. I fooled the plant into thinking it's seen all kinds of stress. And what did it give me back? But a renewed capability to grow with a vigor it didn't have before. Okay. This kind of diversity is not genetic diversity. In other words, I didn't do exactly what Mother Nature does with bacteria, but I may have done something close. Plants cannot afford to have their genes mutated all over the place. Why? Because they're multicellular like we are. We've got all kinds of rigging that bacteria don't have that allow our cells to communicate with each other and make sure that they diversify into the functions they have to carry out. You can't go messing around with that with random mutations or that organism won't survive. But what you can do that bacteria cannot do is you can go in to the genetic information and instead of changing it permanently, you can change it impermanently and massively change it throughout. And the way we do that is DNA is made up of A's and C's and G's and T's. You've all heard that, the double helix. Those bases basically define, and the order they come and define what a gene is. Well, it turns out that those C's, those cytosines, I'm, you're looking at one here. It's, it's just the chemical example can actually undergo methylation, take on a methyl group where they didn't have one before. In a stretch of DNA, the more cytosines that are methylated, the lower the expression of that region. The fewer cytosines that are methylated, the higher the expression. Imagine if you wanted to come up with a deal like bacteria have of massively changing your genetic information in order to, to, to deal with a whole lot of stress. Imagine, a, can you imagine a more elegant way to do it? than to be able to change the methylation patterns throughout the genetic information in order to change gene expression in all sorts of different ways. That seems to be what Mother Nature's doing in response to that one gene I tampered with. So, that gene that I tampered with, that gene that my lab cloned, it's plant mutes. It's basically the same gene in a plant configuration that Mother Nature's already been tampering with in bacteria in order to allow bacteria to survive adverse environments. How beautifully elegant is that? That basically one thing links us all the way through to higher organisms like plants from single cell bacteria. So I'm not going to tell you that this is going to solve all our problems, although I will tell you that so far we have been able to double yields in all of the crops we've tried this in so far. So it's a little bit promising as maybe one of the ways we could think about manipulating the genetics of our crops in the future, and it gives us a teeny bit of hope. But what I am going to tell you, although this may not solve all our problems, I do want to leave you with the idea that whether or not we solve this challenge over the next 38 years, Mother Nature is sure as heck going to give it a very hard try. These are the kinds of tools, the kinds of discoveries we've never made before that I think you're going to be seeing again and again coming up over this 38 years as you challenge the scientific community to meet this global challenge that we're going to face. Okay? And I just want to leave you with the names of the people who did this work because these people work in my lab. They're all young people and they very much believe in what they're doing. And they believe in it not only because it's going to generate publications for them, give them jobs in the future, but because they really believe they can make a difference with research like this. So thank you very much.